that zombie takeout is stranger than fiction. We've been getting by for 533 episodes on that one. Welcome to episode 533 of Zombie Takeout, the B Moving Cult Movie Show. I'm John. And hello, I'm Scotto. And before we get to this week's movie, I have a bit of a discussion topic that I think will come up on, on both shows this week because it's, it fits. Um, I was watching a, a D&D YouTuber, uh, Bob World Builder, earlier today, and he was talking about buying the books instead of using something like D&D Beyond where you can like access the books. Hmm. And it got me to thinking about, um, you know, I recently bought an album on on uh, iTunes of so Last Dinner Party's Pearl of to see, and of course, then I went to, you know, streaming services. Particularly, um, Max came to mind because they like to pull things. Yeah, I think physical media is going to make a comeback. Like they just pulled some cartoons that I know my nephew really liked, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah, just go on. Because <laughs> the point Bob World Builder was making about buying the physical books is if you use a service that you know um, has them on their servers, you know that you're not actually just downloading the PDF, they can edit and change them and remove them whenever they want. And you can't do a damn thing about it. So you should just buy the books. Um, I think physical media is going to make a comeback because people are tired of having things removed from them. Hasn't been much of an issue with music except you know obviously spotify how often do you notice something you have in a playlist isn't available anymore it's weird with spotify they um yeah there are some things that i, I you know though it's not them pulling it if it were up oh, to spotify the artists or the label i know they would have everything yeah. ever recorded on there for right. you to listen to it, yeah, yeah, in that case it's not the service doing it it's the artist or the label but Still, if you have the CD or the vinyl, if you're into that, you have it whenever you want. Well, I guess you can rip it and put it on yeah, something to carry it around. With what you. we did before streaming was a thing. Um, I just think people are going to get tired of the uncertainty that comes with not having uh, either physical access or at least hard drive access, because even digital downloads aren't a thing anymore right you know everything I, lives in the cloud on somebody else's server i think the one thing that and i'm gonna sound really old saying this but mm-hmm. one thing that the kids don't uh know or understand is uh how much space your physical media winds up taking up <laughs> oh yeah. yeah they'll find out <laughs> i mean I, you know, I still have a lot of my old physical media. I probably mm-hmm. have most of it, but it's it's in boxes, kind of in storage somewhere. And uh, I, I don't know. It, it's kind of liberating to not have it all out. I still have all of my DVD collection. The DVDs themselves all fit into a large, you know, those book-style cases, one of those. Yeah. Um, but the jewel boxes are taking up the entire... Uh, top fifth of a wall on a shelf yeah um the other thing that made me think about this is the last dinner party uh also just put out a short film basically four videos from their album just just kind of woven together into a storyline that's kind of very similar to suspiria it's kind of fun um but on the dvd release which is what they're selling not the digital version there's behind the scenes stuff and there's they're throwing in an, an extra EP of acoustic versions and covers. EPR album, I'm not sure. Um, and I'm very seriously considering buying it. Uh, and the whole thing, again, just got me thinking about that. And we talked when we reviewed Fanny about how you know kids are actually still buying vinyl or buying vinyl yeah. again. Um, it's going to become about having the physical object. Which is what a lot of Gen Xers and probably elder millennials talked about when we all switched over to digital. We missed yeah, the having the physical with the object. physical media, though, that, uh, that I don't miss is the quality of the, um, well, the condition. Like, mm. I, had, I had some DVDs that, you know, I absolutely loved, but 
they they weren't that good. They they sort of died after oh. a few years. Huh. Like I had a really nice version of Monty Python and the Holy Grail with like a you know a sequence of the film mm-hmm. itself in like a thing but the dvd was very skippy and and yeah i never had a dvd wear out or a cd wear out on me um oh yeah yeah definitely i mean i had some cds that went way back and they were just kind of eh. <laughs> <laughs> but i i think because there are you know a lot of the people in their 20s now don't remember physical media right oh yeah that's that's it's totally why i was gonna like become kids. <laughs> a niche you know novel sort of thing to them now and how much room are people going to really have in their places you know i mean but i, I don't know I, how I, large a place i'm going to get when i eventually mm-hmm. get out of this two-bedroom apartment thing but you know but we remember that yeah we know what that's like um they don't kids who've only known digital physical media is appealing for a number of reasons you know so I'm saying I'm not missing it all that much, really. I'm not but... necessarily missing it, because I, 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 I'm a, still a bit of a pirate in some ways. Um, I haven't given up that. Um, that is what I think is going to come back. Possibly. The piracy. Yes. Um, I, I, I honestly think that we're going to see, we'll see if this is prophetic, but I think digital media is going to make it come back because of the novelty of having the actual physical item. Um, and I can oh. see vinyl because it's nice and collectible, and you can, you know, you can see the pictures much better on it, and it's the just notes. bigger. Yeah, that's the only advantage. Um, I'm, I'm not a visual person, so I, I, I actually only have two vinyls. It was never a thing for me. I was on cassettes and then uh, CDs. And really, it also depends upon how many different subscriptions you're going to have to carry. You know. Mm-hmm. Well, that's the other thing is if you have a, a collection of stuff you know you like, it's a lot cheaper than paying monthly for the service that happens to have this movie. Like for music, they're all on, you know, mm. they're they're very ex- they're, there aren't any exclusive deals anymore. Right. Like when things were starting out, they were you know like Pink Floyd was only on Spotify for a mm. little bit, and then they they moved over to everybody else. But I mean, what if that starts changing with these big conglomerate deals mm-hmm. going on uh, of you know selling the catalogs? Well, that's the thing with the streaming because everything has gone streaming and in the cloud. Yeah. Like I said, not, it's not even about you know having the digital file on your computer. Yeah. And I don't know if we necessarily have things in place to bring us back to that era outside I mean- of piracy. I tell you the truth, I, I don't miss the days of having it on a hard drive either. Although, you know, honestly, I made some good, some decent money for a little bit there, just organizing some professors. <laughs> iPad. He paid me, I forget how many days to go through his uh, his iPod. Wow. <laughs> it, it was a mess though. He had duplicates. He mm-hmm. had all this shit all over the place, right. and yeah, it, it, he needed it. <laughs> I think I was there for something else, and it wound up just being, hey, could he do that too? Mm-hmm. And I was like, yeah, sure, what the hell? <laughs> yeah, I recently went through and, and cleaned up my hard drive, my documents folder and such. And yeah. Yeah, it was a job. Um, and, and I deleted a lot of stuff. I still have a lot of media on my hard drive. Um, but there's a lot of stuff I wanted to keep around. And I think digital space is maybe less of a premium than physical space, obviously. Mm. But, again, I don't think we have the mechanisms in place unless it be do return to piracy. And that's always a stopgap. Yeah. Yeah, it is. For most people. Um, For the mainstream, that's a stopgap. A lot of the stuff I pirated I did not keep for a mm. long period of time. It was just, I'm going to watch this, and then it's gone. I don't want this, like, hanging out on my hard drive. Well, what I mean by stopgap is... When people when the mainstream turns to piracy, it it shows a flaw in the system that yeah the the corporations quickly fix and, <laughs> o- and try to offer people what they want. Streaming exists because piracy showed a flaw in the system that the corporations then pivoted to you know uh, give an option that they were hopefully to profit off of. Though I think we've since learned that streaming was never profitable. 
Right. Um, it might be again someday uh, if they can, you know, hmm. they, they need to merge down these channels, though. I don't see that happening. I, I Anyway, we'll see how this goes. I, I, I think we'll, we're going to see. Uh, but it, it is a good topic right now because not only Max, but Netflix hmm. just cancels things uh-huh. very willy nilly. Yeah. Oh, yeah, true, true. Like they, and, there, there's a show chaos on there mm-hmm. that big name starring Jeff Goldblum and everything. It's um, about the Greek gods. And it was this thing oh, yeah. that I, I, when I had Netflix last month, I watched, I started watching an episode. I, I haven't started it yet, but they had three seasons in mind, like pre-written mm-hmm. story, oh. three seasons. Uh, they cancel it after one. <laughs> uh, glad I didn't get into it. Um. <laughs> yeah, me too. Honestly. But, you know, when you have bands who are pushing vinyl and a DVD, young bands, I, I, I think they might be onto something. I, might be, I think they might see where the trend is going, more so than we can, certainly. Well, it's a souvenir also, you know? Yeah. I mean, what, what can you do? Like, you can sell a T-shirt or you can sell mm-hmm. some form of medium that they can all sign and stuff, too. Yeah. So I, that's another part of the reason I'm thinking about this is I was on the TLDP uh, website looking at the merch and a lot of it is vinyl and, you know, this DVD that they're now selling. <laughs> anyway, we'll see how that goes. Um, on to this week's movie, which is from 1975, Listomania. Of course, that brings us to the impromptu plot summary, sponsored by the 70s. That must have been some really good shit. And also brought to you by musicals. You know, they could have gotten away with it if they just wrote some better songs. All right. So we begin um, with uh, our hero um, playing with some tits. Mm-hmm. <laughs> this movie does not waste any time. I, I was kind of like, did was there a section missing on the video? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah because they're just in this and then uh, of course he's uh so he it's an affair because her husband comes home and catches the two of them and there's a duel and there's zero you know preempt to any of this there's no setup right this is just how it is and uh the the first Oh, song I'm putting in quotes. You can't see that, of course, um, in my air quotes. Uh, is sort of a square dance song to the to the to the duel, and it's just like have have I been dosed or something? Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's a reaction, like what is going on here? And um, he loses the duel and sentences them to be locked into a piano and put on railroad tracks and sent off yeah you're right that was some really good shit that they had <laughs> to have been on well at least um at least the the director writer of this um, ken russell yeah yeah <laughs> um director of altered states tommy um a movie <laughs> called gothic we reviewed in 2017 that i was uh, i just saw a review of on uh Council of Geeks that pointed out the movie has no plot. It's all about atmosphere. It's gothic, or gothic rather, um, which I loved. You hated because your first words at, at, when you were about to give your rating, "I need a plot." <laughs> <laughs> so right, I, I, I think he did a lot of this here too because then we get to we actually do get to the plot really mm-hmm. uh, after that because. It, that that whole intro scene had really no bearing on the story whatsoever. But Ken Russell is always all about atmosphere and vibes much more than he is about straight line plots. So we begin the the plot in earnest at you know the backstage of a concert. Uh, it kind of has the vibe of a modern day concert, but it's really back in the nineteenth century. Uh, List is uh, waiting to go on. He's at a party, though, and he's just not feeling the inspiration yet. And uh, it's a who's who, of course. Mm. And, uh, you know, it's you, you realize 
you know, the comparison is spot on. You know, they're <laughs> the, the these were the rock stars of yeah. their day, all of them. And uh, it really turns out that there wasn't an exaggeration to to all of, some of this. You know, the the crowds, the the the, you know, the screaming girls, the the whole thing. The term listomania was coined by the German romantic literary figure Heinrich Helm, a contemporary of Liszt, to describe the massive public response to his virtuosic piano performances. Liszt's performances, of course. At these performances, there were allegedly screaming women, and the audience were sometimes limited to standing room only. I've heard a story from multiple places, including a podcast that I, I'm inclined to believe, that Liszt bought a dog whose fur was very close in color to his own hair because several of his female fans requested locks of his hair. <laughs> he would send them locks of the dog's hair. Now, there is a plot that he, he sneaks in here because there's young Wagner. Um, I love what they did to Wagner. <laughs> What's that? I love what they did to Wagner. <laughs> Man. <laughs> And you know, I, I didn't see it coming either. I was, I was thinking, are they just going to gloss over like Wagner's beliefs, not realizing that mm -hmm. it was going to be like the whole, the story. heart of the movie? <laughs> yes, Wagner was a piece of shit. <laughs> and, uh, and so was his daughter, by the way. That was legit. Yeah. Well, I, I'm not sure really how much. After well, Wagner passed away, they had, they had, she and Wagner had formed this festival, founded this festival. After yeah. Wagner passed away, she continued the festival and continued to push anti-Semitic ideas. And for what I understand, Liz Stephen, you know, contributed to that festival too. Mm -hmm. You know, before he passed, they they were they got on in the end. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, this whole the whole story. Well, here. that part was was fictional. That you know, yeah. uh, there was any kind of uh, <laughs> conflict between Liszt and, and Wagner. And there was a little, like when he was with his daughter. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that he was, wasn't that was obviously tough thing to get over. You know, but he was twenty something years older than Wagner was twenty something years older than her, his daughter. You know, it was, a, it was a it was a tough pill to swallow, but he eventually <laughs> did. Yeah. And you know, they they got back on, and and I think Liszt outlived Wagner actually. <laughs> By a few years so uh well anyway back to our story here that not not the real life the the actual story well right. not the, the actual story the fever dream that was the story <laughs> here <laughs> um we uh so wagner is um is is broke he's unknown but list is introducing him to the establishment uh pays him for his song and then when he he goes out and performs it, uh, he kind of does some, you know, fucking around with it. And uh, Wagner, of course, is deeply hurt, but um, it still gets, you know, him the spotlight. And um, let's see. After that, they they cut back to the um, to the romantic relationship, and. Um, they, they the get woman he this... was in bed with at the beginning, he goes on to have a long relationship with and multiple kids. And uh, they they um, they do this strange Charlie Chaplin number. Yeah, I so that. I guess I guess that would be the fourth. The yeah, that's that the, was definitely one of the second songs. song. Yeah, um, yeah, yikes. <laughs> <laughs> it it is this whole like thing out of left field does not make a whole lot of sense um and the story the, the, in real life in the end um isn't quite like that either like where the kids live to a much older age than they had portrayed in this movie <laughs> just getting killed in the war here for some reason well two of his kids did did, did pass away yes uh, fairly young but they they had him portrayed like dead mm. in the war. I think they lived into their twenties, actually. Oh, okay, yeah, probably possible. Like they're both still fairly young, quite young. One had like mm. sepsis and mm -hmm. and had yeah. like you know a cancer removed and died in surgery or at, from surgery, and I forgot what the other one died from. But it it, it wasn't in a war like uh. they portrayed here. <laughs> that was that was uh, just some uh, insanity that they had at the end. Um, but then he's uh, he goes, 
he, he goes on tour, Ken Russell, yes. He goes on tour and uh, pretty much ending the relationship with uh, his wife there. I don't know. If they, I don't know if they were actually married or not, though. I don't think they actually married. Yeah, I guess they couldn't have been because he's looking to get remarried mm-hmm. when he's away. So right. that would be big of him. Hmm. And um, so, yes, he goes to um, this princess that had been at his show earlier uh, to look her up. And um, she kind of takes her in. And I guess the third song would be um, what he has to uh, give up. Mm-hmm were the gift of good writing but i guess i didn't really view, think of that as a song in itself but it kind of was there were lyrics there were there were um and yes uh i had some bluebeard flashbacks mm-hmm. uh because there was a giant dick mm-hmm. and uh although guillotining the giant dick that's uh that's a chef's kiss <laughs> Ken fucking Russell crazy that we did not even come up with <laughs> but i guess we had a show to stick with and ken russell could do whatever the fuck he wanted to do right <laughs> uh so of course that's all symbolic and just uh, a, a dream which i mean would make a lot of sense uh, and maybe if that opening scene was just a dream sequence too who knows <laughs> So, uh, he gets this talent, he, um, and really, I think in real life, it's just, he's giving like piano lessons and shit. (laughs) He's, you know, doing some tours and, and does a lot of fundraising too. And he's, he's very pious in, in general in real life, Mm -hmm. but here, um, I'm not really sure what, oh, like the war breaks out and stuff. And there are uprisings in Germany at that time. And Wagner does take a part of it, and uh, they they uh, pretty much each time you see Wagner in this film, he's become something different. Mm-hmm. The, he's the become second more time, and more unhinged. The second time you see him, he is now a vampire, and that's when they come out with the full like, you know, yeah. Nazi, you know, mm-hmm. inspiration that he's. It was his plan all along to create you know someone to to do mm-hmm. you know for germany what what they what hitler did although they, he doesn't do what they did in Shalarama, which is what you expect mm. and he um he pretty much uh sucks the blood of of Liss mm-hmm. and uh i i guess he he dosed him and then sucked his blood and then got out with some money mm-hmm. of his of course list in real life uh sent funds to wagner all the time <laughs> mm-hmm. so he he wasn't broke like they were saying he was um like all he had was his music right. um and uh, there there was a big contention with about him getting married this uh this princess was stuck in this marriage that she could not get absolved um and they they uh, they wind up not being able to get married in the end, so they they pretty much just split up after that. And uh, he continues to, well, in this in the movie here, he uh, he figures out that Wagner has um, has become a monster. Mm. So he goes on a quest to find Wagner. Well, he becomes uh, a monk. Right, or a priest right. of some sort. He becomes a, a person of man of the cloth. And yeah, he, and he really did do that. Actually, the, well, he, the, he, that no, abbey he, was real. He'd considered it uh, before he went into music. He was very extremely religious. He, he never actually. Well, no, he did. He didn't become a full priest. He'd taken right. steps to. He had started in that direction, but never finished. That abbey title, I believe, was real. Mm-hmm. That he actually had. So it was kind of like. Yeah, it's kind of like a deacon kind of thing where mm-hmm. he was with the church but not a priest kind of thing. I also and, wanted you know, to were... watch a, a short history of, of List before this. Uh, so he, he had started in the direction of becoming a priest but never finished. Yeah. Yeah, that they, that, that is an element in this. That's that's mm-hmm. true. Also, his father, you know, said, what do you want mm-hmm. to do that for? You right. know, and, and you know, he really, his father was a, a really, in you know, crucial part of his development 
right. that we don't get in this because I mean that's just not as interesting a story as uh, <laughs> what's presented here and uh, so he goes on a quest to find uh, Wagner because Germany is just in chaos and and there's just uh, everything is wrong and when he finds Wagner this time Wagner is now Dr. Frankenstein and he's uh, working to put together the Superman that will, um, you know, do the uh, final solution. I would have um, to drag, drag Nietzsche into it. <laughs> oh, it is kind of... Nietzsche was not problematic in the same way that Wagner was. Oh, you know, anything could be used. <laughs> oh, yeah, his, his work was used in that, but he himself was not. Yeah. And uh, so uh, this creation is, of course, Thor. Mm. Um, man, <laughs> the stunt casting here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, uh, well, Liz just kind of laughs at it. And, uh, you know, it, it's kind of a disaster and doesn't really work out for him. And Thor um, just kind of leaves and is never seen again. Yeah, Thor just, you know, yeah, there's no really solution to what happens with Thor. He just doesn't work out. Um, I think they really imply that Wagner keeps uh, Liz captive in this, and mm -hmm. uh, his daughter tortures him uh, with the, some sort of voodoo doll thing, which is really weird to throw into this, but, and, and that is eventually what kills him in the movie, and uh you know, he goes to heaven. Uh, he's kind of redeemed. And uh, meanwhile, Wagner... Um, well, yeah, it's right. Wagner kind of gets killed, doesn't he? Well, Wagner goes on to grow a Hitler mustache and, and kill all of Europe, basically. Well, right. But Wagner gets killed in the whole... Uh, yeah. Well, you, you're kind of skipping over the most fun part of the movie. So List goes to heaven is reunited with all the women he loved. And all of them kind of form Voltron in this spaceship. Yes. That is shaped like organ pipes and a cross. Or no, organ pipes with wings. And they fly to Earth and shoot Wagner from the spaceship. Right. Wagner, Wagner is dead, but comes back as a zombie. Oh, right. Yeah of hitler mm -hmm. <laughs> so he's this zombie hitler who you know just starts you mm -hmm. know gunning down jews in the street of germany mm -hmm. and you know so it's it's kind of a crystal knock thing that goes on for a ridiculously long amount of time right. and um this that's when the voltron from heaven comes down mm -hmm. kills him which is why I wanted the title of Who's Ex Machina. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, I don't know if we mentioned, but List is played by Roger Daltrey. <laughs> yes. List is played by Roger Daltrey and uh, Hilarity ensues. Mm -hmm. I loved the bedazzled metronome in the opening scene. Um, as a musician, I just got a kick out of that, although I've very rarely used a metronome. Um, I was kind of distracted. <laughs> The duel was great. Um, I love that they completely play that duel for comedy. They don't actually really fight much at all. Right. Um, it is kind of the French farce, you yeah. know. Could have done without the square dance song. Um, oh, definitely. Um, it, it would have been better if the whole resolution of that wasn't so weird. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> like, what was that? Oh, they I, I got a kick out of the piano. piano. Sealing them in the piano and then having... And, and then putting it on a train tracks. And apparently, um, when he, we go to the backstage scene, that was a flashback. Like, that had already happened. And we have no idea how they survived it. Right. They it kind never of, resolved it, that. It ends with an explosion. The train comes, and the, mm -hmm. there's, like, this big explosion. And then next thing you know, he's backstage. Which is kind of... What? Okay. <laughs> When you see it's a Ken Russell movie, forget any expectations of linear logic. Yeah, but you still need a plot. <laughs> it, 
it still has to like make some sort of sense or else i mean pretty much anybody could do this that you know but if you just throw things out like that he has a particular flair for the bat shit that i don't know think a lot of people can touch um loved the crowd at the concert screaming for chopsticks <laughs> He just threw chopsticks into the middle of the Wagner pieces. I right. forgot to look up if he composed it. I I'm, I don't know offhand. That's a good question. Uh, if that's uh, is that a list original? I just love how unhinged that whole concert scene was. Um, Hans von Bülow, who was um, a composer, a, a, who was actually slightly after uh, List, was picking uh, groupies out of the audience for him. Right. It was just like the modern day, you know, yeah. fixer, just kind of, mm -hmm. okay, which one you want Send to talk about? the roadie out with the passes, kind of deal. Yeah. Um, loved uh, Daltrey breakdancing on the piano. In 75, he was breakdancing on that piano. He was. Well, is that like kind of the um, the Eastern European um, well, dance, he was doing really? The, well, the, the Russian dance with where you the, yeah. kick forward. But he also did some breakdancing. Yeah. Um, I don't know what the move is called, but it's the one where you have you're kind of you have your hands on the ground and you're kind of kicking on both sides of your hands just before you go into the real flamboyant shit. Um, hmm. I don't know what that move is called, but he was doing that. Um, granted, breakdancing was around at this time. I just wouldn't have expected anybody in this movie to have been aware of it. Um, just not quite the Olympic sport back then. Well, no. Um, <laughs> Nor is it now. <laughs> The bit with Marie and his kids, I felt kind of took the wind out of it a little bit. Oh, yeah. And the Charlie Chaplin, the Chaplin thing, thing was weird. Just doesn't belong in there whatsoever, you mm -hmm. know? Um, you know, it's like making a soup, you know? <laughs> and you're, you can only, you can have flavors that complement each other. You can have maybe a rando flavor in there that like, whoa, I didn't see that coming. But when you start piling up rando flavors on top of rando flavors, you kind of get this thing where it's just like, what? See, I love that. Um, the bit with the voodoo doll was weird. Yeah. It, again, totally unnecessary. Well, it, it pays off in the end. It's Chekhov's voodoo doll. But, oh, yeah, but I mean, <laughs> they, they could have come with a better way of killing him. It was just, it was very uninteresting, actually. It's like, oh, she really tortures him and kills him with it. I, it was weird and fun. But then in the initial scene, you know, it's before he leaves for tour, and he, yeah. th he tells her something along the lines of, don't use it as a pit cushion. And it's just weird that she has this doll of her father. And it's almost this kind of flirtatious moment. Yes. With his daughter, which is weird. But that that I'm expecting fully from Ken Russell. <laughs> yeah. And the fact that when they were in heaven that she's with the other women that, you know, he seduced and stuff. Oh, and then when one of them was his wife. Yeah. And and List had a forty year relationship with Princess Carolyn. Or Carolyn. Yeah. So it wasn't just women he seduced. Um granted it was women he had had romantic relationships or sexual relationships with, plus his one daughter. Yes. Even though they established in the film he had two other kids. Right. So, yeah, there is an implication there. Um, yeah. Huh. I hadn't fully thought that out. Um, <laughs> when he goes to meet Princess Caroline, I loved the smoke coming out of the ass scu sculptures <laughs> to knock him out. I mean, okay, why not? <laughs> and and she's there with a cigar, and, and you know, they're talking about how much she likes smoking, and she says she even fumigates her visitors with cigar smoke because fresh air disgusts her. <laughs> As an ex-smoker, I have to grudgingly respect that line. Um, now, a lot of, there were some really beautiful sets in this. Mm -hmm. I, not the ass gas uh -huh. chamber, but like that courtroom, you know, her courtroom. Um, With all the just... penises? <laughs> the penises were there before the musical number. That's true. That's true. 
And there were a lot of very explicit, at least in my uh, to my thinking, very explicit for 75, 69 references at the start of that scene. <laughs> yes. Yes, there were. And then the musical number happens. Um, I like Daltrey miming playing the lyre like it's a guitar. Yes. Because he plays guitar. Daltrey actually plays guitar. He doesn't play piano, which he said no. was a, a, a problem. <laughs> I never would have guessed that for this. <laughs> I barely play. You don't play at all. I think we could both tell he doesn't play. Oh, I could tell he did not play. Yeah. I mean, and I was like, for how many scenes they had of him, you know, head bopping and playing, they could have at least gotten him to practice a little <laughs> before doing this. He kind of had this cloth thing going where his hands moved around the keyboard, but never really moved in position. <laughs> Like, he just didn't move individual fingers. He just put the claws down of, all over the keyboard. Yeah, that was that was distracting. And I was worried that it was going to go on even longer, that, that the whole movie was just going to be him playing piano concert badly after piano concert. There was also some weird panning of the dialogue. Turns out this was the first movie made in Dol- Dolby Stereo. Yeah. I mean, you can imagine that. You've got a Beatle, you've got a member of The Who, you mm. know. Yeah, I think it's it's similar to like a lot of the early stereo recordings where they just or multi track recordings where they just had a little too much fun with the panning. Yeah. Before they really kinda got a sense of what you're supposed to do with that. Um I had no idea Wagner was a revolutionary. Yeah. Yeah, he went through uh he went through a lot. Okay. <laughs> he uh had different opinions at different points in his life. Hmm. I had seen bits and pieces of this movie before watching it today. I think I probably saw them on Night Flight back in the 80s. Um, oh, so uh, it was probably what edited down to an hour. Yeah, exactly. Well, or edited for television as well. <laughs> yes. So I really did not know what to expect um, or was not prepared for a lot of it. Um, the idea that he meant to inspire Hitler was surprising. Right. And I mean, it's not that they did him dirty or anything, because, no. you know, he, you know, he did. He did. <laughs> yeah, and he couldn't have seen it coming, but yeah. Right. Um, Ringo Starr as the Pope was great. It was weird that Ringo Starr came in as the, uh, uh, well, I guess it was the Pope disguised yeah. as a, a, a his monk. His first at appearance, first. he's disguised as a monk with uh, an eye patch. An eye patch. As he the eye patch. <laughs> Little Nell from Rocky Horror Picture Show is in it uh, as a groupie who rapes him at gunpoint. List this is. Now, were there any other? Was there anybody else from Rocky in this? Because this. Not that I noticed. This very much feels like yeah. Tommy meets the Rocky Horror Picture Show. And and Russell was not involved with Rocky at all, as far as I know. Um, like I thought, there. I thought I saw Tim Curry in there with the wig or something, but I don't think he is. I don't think it was him. It may share some, uh, some of the Transylvanians, perhaps. Maybe, um, depending on where it was shot. I loved when he's looking for Wagner's castle and everybody runs away from him screaming. <laughs> you had mentioned Frankenstein, and, and yeah, obviously there's the Frankenstein parallel. I was getting Dracula vibes. Well, he was Dracula the first time well he, the second I mean, he time had the fangs of course he was a vampire yeah but also you know when he's looking for the castle it's that's kind of the the, the shtick in a lot of dracula movies is everybody's afraid of dracula's castle so they were kind of playing him up as dracula there um the virgin sacrifice scene i'll call it looked like a lot of what coppola was going for in his dracula but couldn't quite pull off oh yeah yeah that was a wild scene um Loved the pointy guitar, but you know, again, the Superman thing. Don't, don't do that to Nietzsche. Um, the, the, the Nazi rally with the kids was a bit on the nose. Man, yeah, I do like that. Uh, you know, they're all wearing these ridiculous fake blonde wigs because mm-hmm. yeah. you know, the whole thing about the master race, and yet none of the people involved seem to have the characteristics of the master race. <laughs> Is that how it always works out? We should mention Rick Wakeman played Thor. Yeah. Hilarious. Um, Dressed as Thor from the comic book. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, Which that wasn't the uh, list the points out. Thor. List mentions he's, he looks like a comic book character. Um, the battle between List and Wagner made no sense, but I loved it. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> um, and yeah, I, I found the the scene of him killing the Jews was really probably the thing in worst taste that we've yeah, seen, I think. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that was a bit difficult. We've seen movies where they have made jokes about that, mm-hmm. but that you could tell they knew the gravity of the situation. And that's the joke that they were making a joke about something so serious, but this, it kind I mean, maybe it wouldn't have been so bad if it wasn't just for, the up-tempo music <laughs> that was going on at the uh-huh. time. It was kind of like, an, oh, isn't this funny? He's this Nazi, you know, thing. It wasn't really played for as a joke, though, because this is the guy that inspired the guy who actually fucking did that. Yeah. So it's not less of a joke, more of a, 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 a batshit way of um, expressing that. It, uh... It just felt very lighthearted in tone. Not the movie. You know? Kind of like, almost like a Keystone Cops sort of feel to it. Which, I mean, kind of ties into them using, like, the Charlie Chaplin, because he was kind of going for old, mm-hmm. you know, cinema tropes. And, and it just, it felt very slapstickish instead of like, holy shit, he's, these people are being murdered, you know? Mm-hmm. But I think the the shock value of it was that dichotomy. The gravity of what he was doing and the tone yeah, was meant the, to be off-putting. Because the solution is, of course, the who ex machina. Yeah. Had it not been for that ending scene where they did blow him up, I would have had big problems with it. But given, that, given how it ends, I, I, I was okay with it. And that final song was just... I was okay with most of the music, but that last song was intolerable. D- didn't they do that in like the Charlie Chaplin scene? Was that just the same song repeated, or oh, it could have been. Yeah, I didn't notice. Which I, I've lost track of the actual songs in this. <laughs> Are we at four? I think that's four. I had said four or five earlier. Yeah, um, off air. So yeah, there's definitely four. And of course, the the rest is fleshed out through uh, you know using lists and. Uh, right. And Wagner's music for, yeah. with Wakeman recording those. Mm. No point to sequels or remakes because there's no place for a sequel, and Ken Russell's movies really should not be remade. I, I don't know if you saw this, but this was the second in what was supposed to have been a series yes. of six movies. He'd previously done a, a, a movie about Mahler. I found it, I think, on YouTube. I want to check it out, I just didn't have time. Well, yeah, we we probably should just to see what, what's there. Mm-hmm. On the brains. On the brains. Yes, it is a sledgehammer with clown makeup on, but I loved it. I'm going five. Ah, uh, it's a. Uh, it could have been really good, but it was kind of tough to uh, watch. I mean, there's scenes, of course, that are great, um, but there's a lot of really bad dialogue. <laughs> It's very stilted. Like, if this movie were made now, you would think the script was uh, written by Chat GPT. <laughs> Just like they took the you know some biography, they took some comic books, and just okay, make a movie out of this. Uh, but there are some really weird things. Um, I'm going two and a half. All right, and what have we learned? Man, I don't know if I can really ever listen to Wagner again. <laughs> Fortunately, I was never much of a fan. It's kind of, you know, proto-metal, you know? Mm. And I learned that you can never really be prepared for a Ken Russell film. (laughs) That's it for Listomania. Until next time, we'll be reviewing the first four episodes of The Expanse on the TV show. I've heard so many people who love this show, so I, I need to finally give it a shot. So then, of course, always remember, never forget, wherever you go in life. There you are. Thank you.